Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Lori Dunnigan. Um, I am one of the coaches with the PC program. And uh, welcome to the weekly workshop. I know you guys are used to having Brittany here. And on the first Monday of the month, I am guest hosting it. And we're talking about um, a specific contract form. So today, we are going to be going over the BRBC, or the Buyer Representation and Broker Compensation Agreement. Um, the BRBC. All right. Um, are you guys currently using the BRBC? No, but I intended to use it on my 230 showing today for pretty much the first time. So. Awesome. Th this is perfect timing then, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to share the BRBC um, on my screen in just a second. There is a, uh, a few different ways that you can fill the form out. And so I'm not going to specifically tell you how to fill it out or what options to choose. Um, that's for you to decide, but we are going to discuss the form and we're going to um, go over what some of the different options are, why you might use one option instead of a different option. Um, some of us have, have different brokers. And so this is an agreement like most of the agreements that are tech, technically between your broker and the client. And so your broker might have specific, um, you know, ways they want you to fill this out. And if that's the case, then I'm going to say, you know, do what your broker says to do. Um, but let's just dis discuss the form. And if you're able to uh, turn on your screen and participate, um, I, I do like that. It's easier to talk to actual faces than just names. Um, and I want you guys to have your questions answered. I may not know the answer to every specific question, but I will do the best that I can to um, answer what I can on the form. The reason that we use the uh, this, this form, the BRBC, is it's kind of like, well, I like to think of it as a loyalty agreement. Um, it's actually, and it's a, it's a contract, so, you know, the the terms in the contract are very specific it's a contract like any other contract um there are it outlines things that are responsibilities of the buyer of the agent or the broker and when i say agent in this conversation um again it's really a an agreement with the broker so ultimately i'm talking about the broker i just might use agent um instead Okay, so um, what it is, is it, it's a it's a compensation agreement. So it identifies if different things happen in the transaction, how we get paid. Um, it's an optional agreement, so we don't have to use it. If we do use it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't 100% guarantee that we'll get paid, but it is a contract that, you know, kind of outlines that we will get paid depending on what options we use. Um, if we don't use the form, high likelihood that in certain scenarios we will not get paid. Um, I have had a couple of clients where if I had been using this form, I would have had a chance to get paid. And because they use different agents, I you know, basically worked for them for free. Um, if you've been in the business long enough, um, that will eventually happen to you for one reason or another. Um, so let me go ahead and pull up the form. Um, before I pull up the form or as I'm pulling up the form, are there any immediate questions on, on it? Yes. If I'm going to use it on a mobile home purchase, is there anything different? We're meeting today, so just kind of quickly. Which nope, one nothing, nothing would be different. Okay. Nothing would be different. What I print out then just for today. Um, so this is the form. So this form, like the purchase agreement or the listing agreement, also has a number of different forms attached to it. We're not going to go over those today, but just real briefly, there's the agency disclosure form. There is the fair housing and discrimination advisory. Um, so during the life of a transaction, your clients may sign these forms more than once, and that's okay. Um, we've got the PRBS, we've got the wire fraud advisory, and then we get to the actual form that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so this form gives us the right to represent a specific client. So for today, we are representing uh, Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. And um, it grants our broker permission, so Keller Williams Realty, and then whatever your market center name is. 
it has to have as any contract it has to have a valid um, period so it's got a beginning date and it's got an ending date you can put that however you want i like to use six months because that's a good time frame and so um, six months would basically be 180 days from now um, by default so with the buyer rep agreements there used to be um, different forms. So there used to be an exclusive form we could use and a non-exclusive form and a couple of other different options. And recently they took all the forms and combined them into one. And that's where I'm saying you have different options that you can select on this form. Um, by default, right here, um, oh, just a second. Okay, yeah. So Lisa, going to your question, it says right here, in acquiring real property or a manufactured home. Um, so by default, it's going to be a non-exclusive agreement unless we check a specific paragraph, which would make it an exclusive agreement. And we'll talk about what those mean in just a second. Um, one of the things on here is that we have to identify um, First of all, that they don't have an agreement signed with another agent. And so right here on number two, they are letting you know that there's no pre-existing buyer rep and compensation agreement with any other agents. If there is, then they would put that here. And because sometimes these agreements are for specific properties, um, and so maybe they have an agreement with another agent for a specific property, or maybe they have a non-exclusive agreement with another agent and we would wanna put that here on number two. And then what we wanna do is we want to identify what properties we're helping them to acquire. And so that's gonna be filled out here on number three and we have some options. So it can be um, on number A, we would put in specific information. On number B, it would be the following specified properties only. So maybe you're showing them only one property and you're just going to put that property address there and that might be the case if you're doing a for sale by owner for example or something similar to that um the other would be the properties identified on an attached list so if there's a bunch of properties and you're going to just put it on a list i'm not exactly sure why you would use that option but that is an option um, but going back up to 3a Okay, so we're gonna identify the location, right? So if we have a client and they're only looking in this specific city, then we could put, you know, for example, the, the city of Tulare or the county of Tulare. Um, I like to put this as broad as I can. And so instead of putting a city or a county, I might put the state of California. And that way, if they purchase any property in the state of California, um, I've got an agreement that that says that I can help them or that I'm representing them um, with that purchase. Um, in my town, we have another city, you know, eight miles up the road, and it would be very easy for them to say, well, I want to only buy in Tulare and then turn around and buy in, in the next city over. Um, and same with counties. Sometimes, you know, in fact, I had a client that said they were going to buy in this county and ended up purchasing in the county just south of us. So I like to put California. Um, for price range, again, I like to leave this as open as possible. Um, I had a client that was looking for a $500,000, you know, um, ranch type home and ended up buying a $25,000 piece of land. Um, they've bought more than that, but just an example, we want to put this as, as wide of a range as we can. Um, and then if there's any other criteria, you can put that there. One of the things that we have to be careful with, because it is an enforceable um, contract, is if we're too vague, it might be determined that it's not really enforceable. But if we're too narrow on it, then it might end up being the case where they bought something else and it doesn't cover it. Um, so just kind of use your, your discretion there. Um, for me, I like to use this form again as a loyalty agreement. And so different parts of it may be more important to me than other parts of it.
Um, so then we're going to talk about in number four, we're going to talk about compensation. So with compensation, it was basically what we're saying is how much do you as buyer owe me if it comes to the point where you're the one that compensates me? And so as we know, usually the seller is the one that pays our compensation, right? But what if it's a for sale by owner situation and the seller isn't um, willing to pay our compensation? Then at that point, this agreement would be with the buyer who is then agreeing to pay our compensation. And so if that's the case, what is the dollar amount or the percentage that we're charging? And so in my county, um, the ideal um, compensation for a listing would be 6% six percent split both ways. So it would be 3%. Um, so you could put 3% here. I've got two and a half written here. If you want to kind of go a little bit less, it's up to you, but um, whatever dollar amount. And then I never put an and here for the dollar amount, but if there's something else that, you know, it's 2% and whatever you would put that there. Um, or you can put a specific dollar amount. So no matter what the purchase, what the price of the property is, you're going to owe me X amount of dollars. Um, Lisa, with a mobile home, I, I don't know about your area, but in my area, sometimes mobile homes can sell for as little as like $40,000 and 3% of $40,000 is not very much. So if I know they're searching for a mobile home, I might actually put a minimum dollar amount here instead. Um, or you can have um, a compensation schedule, which would be attached. I don't even really know what that would look like. It would it would mean in different scenarios. So maybe that would be um, if you buy a mobile home under this amount, it's this amount or whatever the case may be. Um, so are there any questions on what we've talked about so far? So then let's talk about um, the broker right to compensation. Um, basically, this is saying that the broker is entitled to compensation um, in the amount that we wrote in number four, if the buyer acquires any property that we described in paragraph number three. Um, it, something interesting um, here is it says, um, and the seller completes the transaction or is prevented from doing so by default of buyer. So if the buyer prevents, like if we're under contract and then the buyer prevents the transaction from happening, technically they're still responsible for your compensation. One of the things that we have to kind of remember with this form though, and just with our industry as a whole, so we are very much, um, you know, a lot of our, our business comes from referrals, um, it comes from, you know, word of mouth. It comes from like our reviews. And so if you get into a position where a buyer backs out at the last minute, technically by this form, they might owe you the compensation for your time and you might very well go after it um, or want to go after it. But keep in mind the negative reviews that you get from doing that might not be worth the compensation that you would get if you did. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And then the other thing to keep in mind is because this is an agreement between your broker and the client, um, ultimately, it would probably be up to your broker whether they pursued that compensation or not. Um, okay, so then, uh, like I said before, we have two choices here. We can do uh, an exclusive representation or a non-exclusive. So right here, 4B1 talks about non-exclusive. And like I said at the beginning, this form automatically defaults to it being a non-exclusive representation unless we mark the next box. And so by non-exclusive, um, what this is saying is that the compensation is payable only if there was broker involvement with the property. And they are very specific as to what broker involvement means. And so it's listed right here, but I'm going to go ahead and, and read the different things. So it means that the buyer physically entered and was shown the property by the broker. And again, by broker, that means us as agents. So our broker is not going to go show them the property, but we're going to show it to them. Um, broker showed the property to buyer virtually. 
And so that would mean that, you know, maybe you went and did a video of it or something like that. Maybe they're an out of town buyer. Um, the broker submitted to seller a signed written offer. So an RPA um, from buyer to either acquire, lease, exchange, or obtain an option on the property. Or the property was introduced to buyer by broker or one for which broker acted on buyer's behalf. Um, and now this one takes a little bit more definition because what does it mean that we introduced the buyer to the property? So most of us have our buyers set up on an MLS search, right? And so if we send a property to the buyer, does that mean we introduced them to the property? For the purpose of this form, the answer is no. So it says, however, merely sending buyer a list of properties shall not be deemed broker involvement without documented action on the part of the broker analyzing the property for the buyer specifically or assisting buyer in the potential acquisition of the property or communicating with seller or seller's agent regarding buyer potential acquisition of the property. So not just emailing them the property, but actually doing a little bit of work, reaching out to the seller, seeing if they have any offers on the property, asking questions on the property on behalf of the buyer, um, those types of things. Um, so any questions on that so far? Okay, so again, non-exclusive is, um, non-exclusive means they can be working with other agents, if another agent shows them the property right next door to one that you showed, they are perfectly within their rights to um, use that other agent to purchase that other house. And there's no um, compensation that's due to you at all because it's non-exclusive. Now, the other option, and again, only if we mark this box, is that they have exclusive representation. And that... Um, it says here that agreement shall be exclusive and irrevocable. Um, that does not mean that it can't be canceled because it can be canceled. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, this, this basically says the broker is going to devote time and resources to assist the buyer in finding and acquiring the property in the expectation of being paid for the broker's services. Broker is entitled to compensation if buyer acquires property during the represent, representation period with or without broker involvement, even if another broker is also entitled to be paid for representing the buyer. And so in the scenario I gave you before where you show them house A, another agent shows them the house next door. If they write up that um, agreement with the other agent, according to this, you would still technically be due the compensation because you have an exclusive representation agreement with them. Any questions on that? All right. And then this says that a buyer includes any person or entity other than the broker related to buyer or who in any manner acts on buyer's behalf to acquire property as described in paragraph three. So essentially meaning if you show the buyer and then maybe an, um, they are part of an LLC and the LLC buys it, not the buyer, or maybe their brother, they, you know, they buy it in their brother's name or whatever the case might be. Um, that's kind of what the definition of buyer is there. Okay, let's talk about cancellation. Um, so at the top of the form, we identified the term of this contract. So like I said, six months is a pretty good term. Um, but they have the right to cancel and the way that they cancel will be different depending on whether it's an exclusive or non-exclusive agreement. Um, and so this says that either the buyer or the broker may cancel this agreement by giving written notice to the other. And so that's an important point is, you know, sometimes we uh, work with clients and we want to help them purchase a house, but sometimes it's better for a number of different situations to no longer work with that buyer, essentially to fire the buyer. And so we have the right to um, cancel this agreement just the same way the buyer has the right to cancel this agreement. Um, so if paragraph 4B1 applies, and so 4B1 is non-exclusive, 
So if we have a non-exclusive agreement, then this agreement can be terminated upon the receipt of this notice or X number of days after receipt. And so I like to put a number in there that maybe it's seven days or 14 days. Um, if it's non-exclusive, I guess it doesn't really matter because um, they have the right to use a different agent anyways. But if they're going to, if I go show them a house tomorrow, yesterday, and then they decide, you know what, I really want to buy that house, but I want this other agent to um, to do the, to write it up. And I don't really want to use, you know, the agent that showed me the house. If I put a 14 day here thing here, then, you know, possibly that home's going to be off the market in 14 days and they won't be able to use the other agent. Um, so I do like to put a number of days here. Um, the other option is if paragraph 4B2 applies, so that means if it's an exclusive agreement, then it's 30 days after receipt of this notice. So um, non-exclusive by default means they can cancel immediately, and um, exclusive means they have to give a 30-day notice. Um, and then it says broker shall be entitled to compensation if during the representation period or any time specified in 4E, and we'll get to 4E in just a second, buyer acquires property for which there was broker involvement um, or broker delivers or and broker, yeah, and broker delivers um, to buyer a written list of those properties for which there was broker involvement. So what that means is if this agreement gets canceled, if you want to be able to retain the right to um, compensation for any properties that you had already been involved in, you have to give them a list of those properties. If it's a non-exclusive agreement where they can cancel it immediately, you have five days to provide them that list of the properties for which you believe you were involved in. Um, if it's an exclusive agreement where it um, it does the 30 days, you're going to want to do it within that 30-day period. Um, I think you might still have five days, but I would do it before that. Um, Let's see, the written list of broker involvement properties shall be del delivered to buyer within five calendar days after the effective date of this cancellation. Before, during, and after the five-day period, buyer is advised to notify any other broker of the broker's rights under this paragraph. Um, and so that kind of goes back to the first part where they were um, stating that they weren't working with any other brokers um, in case they were, and then it got canceled. Okay. Any question on on that? Hey, Dory, um, I have a quick question. What is the you say if you, they cancel? Um, in the, uh, we have uh, thirty days after they receive the notice. What what way they cancel? Verbally so or, would, or they have uh, initial something? Um, they could just send you an email because they're not going to have, like, if we're canceling on them, there's a form that we should use. But okay, as buyers, they don't have access to forms. So they can just send you an e email saying that they're canceling. And, or an email say hey, you can cancel any time with an email. And, okay, perfect. Okay. okay, there is one other option on the cancellation of this agreement. And that's if you mark the box for C2. And this is only if it's a um, exclusive agreement. It says neither party shall have the right to cancel this agreement prior to expiration except by mutual agreement. So if we were gonna cancel this, we would have to mutually agree to cancel it. Um, so that is another option. And I, I like to keep in mind, so um, we're not trying to trap our buyers into working with us. Um, if I'm not doing the best job for the buyer, then I fully, you know, can see where they might want to go work with another agent. You know, maybe I've got something personal going on in my life and I'm just not doing the best job for them. Um, I'm not trying to trap them into this agreement with me. Right. And that is one of the things I don't really like about this agreement is because we have them sign it uh, when we first start working with them and they don't necessarily have 
um, experience working with us? You know, do we call them back right away? Do we answer their questions fully? Because if we're an agent who doesn't do that, then we shouldn't have them trapped into this agreement. Um, but they do have the cancellation, right? So um, that would be a reason why I would not mark box C2 because I don't want them trapped. Um, I'm going to do my best job for my clients simply because that's what I do, right? Okay, so now we're going to talk about payments. Um, what what happens? So we've agreed up above that um, they're going to owe us 2.5%. So in what scenarios do they owe us that two and a half percent? And so, um, first of all, this says that if anyone other than the buyer compensates broker for services, so that would be like if the if we do a transaction and the seller's agent pays us, which they normally would, right? Um, so if they compensate us for services covered by this agreement, that amount shall be credited toward the buyer's obligation to pay compensation. So for example, let's say that we had written this up at 3%. So buyer owes us 3%. And then we find them a house and the house, um, the seller's agent is only offering 2.5% commission. So we are losing out on half a percent of commission, right? And so what this is saying is that um, the 2.5% is going to be credited towards that 3% of this agreement um, but now what happens to that other other half a percent? So that's what we're going to fill out here. If third-party payments received exceed the buyer's obligation, so in this case right here, that would be um, that we only asked for 2%, 2.5%, but they're paying us 3%, then that excess is going to be um, either paid to the broker, which is standard language, so yay, we get the full 3%, or credited to the buyer. So if we get paid extra over what we agreed to in this agreement, um, if, if we mark this box, that extra payment gets credited to the buyer. Um, and then the reverse of that, um, you know, if we get paid half a percent less, are we going to force the buyer to pay that extra half percent or are we just gonna be happy with the two and a half percent that the MLS offered us. And so um, at this point, you guys have to decide, first of all, if you're using this form, because you don't have to use this form, but we recommend it. If you use this form, are you doing it exclusive? Are you doing it non-exclusive? How many days are you giving them to cancel if it's non-exclusive? Um, what happens if you get overpaid? What happens if you get underpaid? What happens if you don't get paid at all? Um, and so those are things that that's why you want to understand what the language is saying and select the appropriate boxes. And the boxes that I check for my business might be the different boxes than what you check for your business. So there is no right or wrong. Bear in mind, we want to do what our broker wants us to do. So they might have a opinion on this. Um, all right. So then we get into this other parts authorization to include commission in the offer. So here, the buyer either authorizes or does not authorize broker to include a term in buyer's offer obligating seller to pay broker directly or through escrow for any compensation that buyer owes to broker. So what that means is on the RPA, and I don't have it up to show you, but I'm going to pull a page right here so I tell you everything correctly. So on the RPA, when it the latest revision came out, um, back in December, there was a new box on here, and that box was 3G3, and there's a box there, and it says, seller agrees to pay the obligation of buyer to compensate buyer's broker under a separate agreement, which is um, a different form. Um, seller's broker's offer, if any, to compensate buyer's broker is unaffected unless otherwise agreed. So basically what this means is, if I have an agreement with my buyer that my buyer is going to um, pay me 3% commission, but the MLS is only offering 2.5%, um, if the buyer marks this box on this, um, on this um, buyer rep agreement, they're giving me permission when I write up an offer and submit that offer on behalf of my client to check that box. And that box is asking the seller 
to pay the additional half percent that is owed by the buyer. Um, I personally don't think that's a good idea because we're in a very competitive market. We're trying to get our buyers, um, you know, the strongest offer possible. And if we're asking the seller to pay us compensation, it weakens our buyer's offer, right? Um, but let me ask again, any questions on that part? Okay. Okay. Um, so that's something, again, that you have to decide um, whether you're going to mark that box or not mark that box. And it's really important. Um, so we all know that a lot of times our clients will sign forms without really realizing what they're signing. It's important that they understand what they're signing. The last thing you want is for them to sign this form and then later on realize, oh, wait, I didn't know that's what I was agreeing to and have them think that you tricked them into signing like an agreement, right? Okay. So, um, so um, 4E, so we referenced this um, up above, um, somewhere up here, right here, when we were talking about the cancellation, it referenced 4E. And so 4E is the additional broker right to compensation that basically says broker is going to be entitled to the compensation if within X number of calendar days after the expiration of the of the rep period of the representation period um, or a cancellation um, buyer enters into an agreement to acquire property for which there was broker involvement prior to this form either expiring or being canceled. Um, and so, again, I'm going to probably put that at something like 30 days. And this just says that if it gets canceled or if it expires, I'm still um, eligible if there was broker involvement on a property. Um, but I also have to give written notice of what those properties were. Okay. Okay. Now, here's something that um, I think a lot of agents don't realize when they use this form, and it's something that um, I haven't really talked about in the past two agents that have used it, but there is a disclosure of anticipated payments to broker by others if we use this form. So basically what this says, and again, depending on which box you, sh you put, either before writing the offer or before showing the property, if we're using this form, we are going to disclose to the buyer the amount of compensation that we expect to receive for that property. And we can do that by either providing a copy of the MLS or there's a separate document um, such as an anticipated broker compensation disclosure, which is the ABCD form. Technically, you could disclose it just in an email if you wanted to. Um, now, when we say the MLS listing, so we have to make sure um, if that is in the private agent notes, we are not allowed to share um, the private agent notes with a buyer. Um, some MLSs are starting to make that information where it's not in the private section. Um, so just make sure that you're adhering to um, your MLS rules because we don't want you to get in trouble with there. Um, if it's in the private notes, you can just share that information. Um, you know, according to this form, you have to share that information um, in a different format. Um, so again, it could be that ABCD form or by an email. And so basically what this is saying is because as a buyer, I have agreed that I'm going to pay you X amount of dollars, I need to know how much money you're getting for this. And I need to know either before I look at the property or when I submit the offer. And then it still does say that buyer is responsible for payment of compensation if the third party does not pay as anticipated. So if it's, you know, in the MLS and they end up paying you short, which really doesn't happen, but, you know, the, the buyer would still be um, responsible to pay you. And part of this could be, again, a for sale by owner. So maybe you've got an agreement with the for sale by owner that they're going to compensate you. And then whatever reason they don't. They're just saying that the buyer, your buyer would still be responsible for paying you. Um, it talks about timing of the compensation. So um, when a transaction gets completed, at that point, you would be um, entitled 
um, if acquisition of the property is prevented by default of the buyer, um, you would still be eligible to, to be paid. So in other words, um, if the transaction doesn't happen and it's the buyer's fault, the buyer still owes compensation. Um, or if acquisi acquisition of the property is prevented maybe by the seller and the buyer gets money in a lawsuit, at that point, they would um, owe you the compensation. And then this says that the payment would be um, done through escrow or it, um, it authorizes the release of the compensation through escrow um, is what H says. Um, and so, and then it says if buyer acquires a property during the time buyer is obligated to compensate another broker, so if they've got an agreement with another broker, then that means you're not entitled to compensation whether you helped the buyer or not. And so that's why you really want to make sure when you're working with the buyer that they're not um, already got an agreement with someone else. And again, a lot of times our clients will just sign forms and not really know what they signed. And so when you ask them, you know, do you have a buyer rep agreement with another agent? You might follow that question up with, well, have you signed any paperwork? Um, and, and, you know, take it a little bit deeper if you need to on that. Okay. So then the rest of this form um, just talks about some of the standard things that some of our forms talk about. Um, it's going to talk about agency relationships. And by the way, this is another good reason to use this form is because um, it, it talks about some of the things that we should be talking about like in a buyer um, consultation anyways. So it talks about agency relationships. It talks about um, the broker's um, what the broker should be doing. It talks about the buyer obligations, um, talks about attorney fees, mediation, arbitration. Um, it says that this is the entire agreement, um, if it's an entity buyer, and then we capture signatures. Um, another form that they have on here is a, and, and this is just automatically added, it's the buyer transactional advisory. And so this is just an advisory um, that tells the buyer, you know, certain information about a transaction in general. Um, okay, and like I said, some of these forms they will sign once they uh, do the RPA anyways, and it doesn't hurt them to, um, to sign them in advance. Okay, so I know we went over a lot, um, and throughout the process, I've asked you if you guys had any questions. Um, we're basically done. Um, I've explained the form, I've explained the different options, um, but I just want to ask you guys again before we end, is there any questions about anything I said on this form um, that you guys aren't clear on or, you know, just question? Um, okay, so from a buyer's standpoint of view, why would they sign this? Because it doesn't sound like it's necessary for them to sign it, but why would a buyer sign this coming from their point of view? Yeah. Um, so let me just open that to, up to the group. Why do you guys think a buyer would, would sign this? Maybe if they feel loyal to you. You feel loyalty? Yeah. It, it's, it shows that you'll work hard for them. Going to work with uh, a client, you want to be sure that, hey, I'm going to spend a lot of time. Uh, this is something just for me, just for the sake that, okay, you're working with me. I'm going to spend time. You are loyal to me. I will be super loyal to you. You can fire me any day, but I will be working as hard as possible. And uh, we we'll go from there. There's some there's like loyalty things that uh, make my can work harder for you. Something like that. Yeah, so it's all going to depend on, and those were all great answers, by the way. It's oh. all going to depend on how you present it to them. And what I like about this form from a buyer's perspective is that there is the ability for them to cancel it. So if they get into it, they decide they don't like working with the agent that they're working with, they can cancel the agreement depending on how the agreement's written up. Um, but basically what we're doing with this form is we are trying to create loyalty with our clients. Uh, real estate does not have, I mean, buyers are not very loyal to their agents, um, traditionally or generally speaking. And I think part of the reason for that is that our clients don't understand how it works. They don't understand that 
We're going to put all of our time and effort into finding them the perfect home. And at the end of the day, we're not getting paid unless we actually, um, you know, complete this transaction. And just having that open conversation and kind of explaining some of that to them, it makes sense, you know, because they're not going to go to work at their job with the risk of not getting paid. And essentially, that's what we're doing. And this form kind of minimizes the risk. But what this form also does is it, at a higher level, it authorizes us um, to work for them. And it, and it you know, because it outlines like what we're going to do as at the broker level or, you know, agent level, and then what their expectations are. So there are many clients that will sign this all day long and not even question it, and they're happy to sign it. Um, a lot of times agents are um, afraid to present this, afraid to ask you know, for this to be signed. Um, there are some agents that won't sign it. So on a personal level, um, I have commitment issues when it comes to stuff like this. If somebody presented this form to me and I read it and understood it, and believe me, I would read it and understand it, um, I wouldn't sign it. And it's okay if, like, it, it would be okay because I'm very lo- I am very loyal, even if I have commitment issues. So once I commit to you, like, I'm yours, right? Um And so you, but it kind of gives you a feel for, is this a client I even want to work with? Are they not signing it because they just don't like some of the terms, but they're going to be great to work with? Or are they not signing it because they're not going to be a loyal client? Um, And again, there's the different options. You know, is it exclusive, non-exclusive? I'm sorry, go ahead. I said, now that you're mentioning it, maybe another form of way of putting it would be, you know, like, yeah, it's a loyalty, but it's also a contract for you to basically hire me and put me to work for you Mm -hmm. to find your property. Yeah. It adds a level of professionalism. Like I'm not just somebody that you call when you want to go see a house and I'm going to drop everything and run and and go serve you. um, When I, you haven't officially hired me, like hire me, like we're agreeing to work together because, um, you know, and, and this is, it's in our scripts and it's something that I use with clients. It's like, I'm going to see if, if we're a good match for us to even work together, because, you know, I got to want to work with you just as much as you got to want to work with me. Right. Cause not everybody's personality is, um, is a match. Um, and so like in the chat, somebody just put, it's an employment contract, right? You're hiring me. Like if you went and met with, um, a lawyer, like it, before they go to work for you, you're probably going to have to sign some sort of paperwork. It's an extra level of professionalism. I was also going to say that I don't just give this to people like right after I meet them for the first time and then say, okay, sign this. I'm giving them value. And we've talked about this when we talk about the buyer's consultation, doing that buyer's consultation for them helps you to provide value up front. And after we do the buyer's consultation, that's when we say, okay, the next step is to sign this agreement. And we've talked about before how we say it's a loyalty agreement too, to say, I'm going to be loyal to you. You're going to be loyal to me effectively. And um, that helps them to understand, like you were saying, it's a level of professionalism. It shows that you're the expert. If you were working with any other advisor at this level, a financial advisor, an attorney, a doctor, anything, you're signing paperwork. And this is the same kind of thing. So I, a lot of agents feel a little bit weird about getting this signed, but I think that most of the time, as long as you're providing value, people are totally fine to sign it. And the people like you said, Lori, the people who won't sign it, aside from people like you, except I don't, I haven't had anybody like you who's like, I'm going to work with you, but I don't want to sign this really like the only people who ever don't sign it. And it's very few and far between once I do this buyer's consultation with them, the only people who won't sign it are people who won't work with me anyway. And I don't want to waste my time. So it really helps us to, to see how serious our clients are. Brittany, you know what? You just said something that makes more sense to me than anything I've ever heard is the level of financial. I mean, you are trusting me and I am trusting you with a large amount of money. This isn't going through a check stand. <laughs> this is a large amount of money in your financial world. So if I yeah. was, I want me to be loyal to you as I want, you know, it's the loyalty of that at the yep. of money is the point. Yeah. Lori, I had a question. Um, 
you may have addressed this because I came in a little bit late, probably right after this, but you had put um, in where the buyer agrees to pay a percentage. You put the percentage. What if you are charging your clients the um, fee that your brokerage charges? Would we put that in the dollar amount in addition? Because it has the percentage and then and. So So this is saying the percentage. Okay, so... Sorry, so you're right. On on floor A, it says it says X percent of acquisition price and dollar amount. So if you are charging a fee like that, that's where that dollar amount would go. Okay. And so we are recommending to put in the two percent as a minimum. I mean, I don't I didn't really do a recommendation on that. So um, as the PC program, are we recommending the two percent? I don't or, know. Oh, <laughs> That's why I was asking you. I thought you would know. Yeah. Come yeah. On, coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. You missed in the beginning where I said I wouldn't necessarily have all of the answers. Um, <laughs> so you can put, so here's the thing. Um, we're all in different market centers and the different market centers have different um, averages. So in my market center, the standard is 6% when you're doing a listing agreement, which gets split, you know, 50, 50, some of the market centers have higher price points and might have lower standard commission numbers. And so really it's got to be what makes sense for, you know, for you and your business and what your broker recommends. Thank you. So that would be my answer. All right, cool. Um, Any other questions, comments, observations? Um, Is there anyone here that will now start using this form who hasn't used it in the past? I'm going to use it in two hours and I feel not even guilty about it (laughs) and completely educated. So awesome sauce. Thanks, guys. (laughs) Awesome. Perfect timing. Okay, great. Well, if there's nothing else, then I just want to say thank you for attending. Um, this was recorded. It will be posted um, within the next you know, few days or a week or so um, if you want to go back and listen to it. Um, the other thing I will say, um, and so Car Legal has a, a podcast that they do. And before I did this presentation, I actually went on to Car Legal. They had a couple of law- lawyers that were discussing this form and they talk about all sorts of different forms, all sorts of issues. And so if you're ever questioning something, um, that's a resource that is available to us just through our MLS membership. And so, you know, keep that in mind. Um, Other than that, I hope you guys have a great day and thank you for attending. Thank you, Lori. You're welcome. That was awesome. (laughs) Thanks. Thank you. Bye.